Hello, everyone, and welcome to another amazing podcast episode from Animal Training Academy. It's great to have you with us today, and I'm really excited about the conversation that we are about to record for you, as we are going to dive deep into some really cool animal training and behavior topics. So get ready to be entertained, educated, and hopefully inspired by today's episode. The aim of these podcasts and Animal Training Academy is to help disseminate information regarding force-free, positive, humane, unintrusive, and, and best, best practice animal training and behavior information that is applicable for all species and designed to help empower you and the animals you work with. I believe that developing a fundamental understanding of this information is crucial for your future success and the tools and resources available from animaltrainingacademy.com are all designed to help you do this. So if you haven't already, make sure you jump over there and check out everything that's on offer. As always, we are bringing another positive reinforcement practitioner onto the show for you today. And this time we're heading to Orlando, Florida to talk to Chris Jenkins. Chris began working with animals at a summer job at SeaWorld San Diego after obtaining a degree in psychology from the Californian University UC Davis. Chris then volunteered at the Sacramento Zoo until he decided to pursue a career working with animals full-time. In 2002, Chris was accepted into the Exotic Animal Training and Management Program at Moore Park College in California. After his time there, he then worked as a wildlife educator at inner city schools in LA. Chris now works for the company Natural Encounters and has been employed by the company since 2005. He is currently the company's COO or Chief Operation Officer. In addition to overseeing one of the company's shows at a major theme park in Central Florida, Chris also instructs animal training workshops and spends time traveling to other animal facilities as an NEI trainer and show development consultant. Chris is certified as a professional bird trainer from the International Avian Trainers Certification Board and is a member of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. The Animal Behavior Management Alliance and the International Association of Avian Trainers and Educators. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome you onto the show today, Chris. How are you? I am doing great, Ryan. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, Chris. Uh, thanks for asking. We're in the future here compared to you there in Florida, nine o'clock Monday morning. <laughs> And you're a, you're a little bit behind uh, in Sunday still, aren't you? I am Sunday, Sunday at late afternoon. Hey, Chris, I've, I've given everyone uh, a really good rundown of some of your background and what you've been up to. Can you maybe help us dive a little bit deeper and, and tell us, take us back, Chris, tell us when you first started learning about positive reinforcement animal training and some of the first animals you ever trained using it. Uh, for, wow, taking it back. So I'm probably at this point, probably about 15 years into working with animals full time in one capacity or another. So I'd say my first kind of basic exposure to positive reinforcement training in, in its most general sort of theoretical sense would have been some of the coursework that I did um, in the psychology department at UC Davis. I, looking back on that now, I think there were opportunities that I could have had to apply that at the time. They've got a, a, a raptor center, they have a primate research center, uh, things I really didn't really know about while I was there. It really wasn't until I started volunteering just on my weekends for something fun to do in Northern California at the Sacramento Zoo, and then later at Moore Park College in the EDEM program, the Exotic Animal Training and Management program, uh, that I sort of got a chance to, to see how some of the stuff that I had learned about, so the textbook information about operant conditioning, how that actually applied to the day-to-day -day jobs that people were doing, um, husbandry training, you know, show behavior training, things like that. So I think the the earliest times I would have actually been applying that would have probably been in that program. Everything from rats to uh, baboons and bobcats and uh, monkeys and reptiles and a little bit of everything. And at that time, my focus was really on the education aspect and the presentation aspect, the training stuff all kind of was secondary for me. And it, it, I'll be quite honest, at that time, I didn't even really like it that much because I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> and I think that I understood the theory really well and I, I could help you know tutor people in the coursework. But um, where it actually came to all make sense to me as far as where the, the theory met up with the practice was probably uh, not until my, my current job with Natural Encounters of getting to work underneath some, some really, really fantastic trainers who could take that information about the science of behavior change and really make that something that made sense in a practical sense and sort of figuring out you know, artful ways to apply that textbook type stuff to the actual work I was doing with animals. So yeah, probably a variety of mixed species of, of mammals early on, kind of fumbling my way through some successes and challenges more than uh, kind of going through it in a more methodical way that 
the way that I probably do nowadays. Oh, that's really cool. And and I like to think about these stories as as people's odysseys, uh, especially someone in your position, Chris. And it's really interesting to learn kind of how you got from where you started to where you are today. And maybe I, I'm just, I, I'm interested personally, and I think other people are interested out there as well, because there's a lot of people, Chris, kind of searching for opportunities to get involved in animal training. Oh, sure. uh, and, and, you know, they want to know how they can do that or what they have to do. And one aspect you mentioned there was attending Moore Park College uh, and we've talked about that before with Debbie Marin on the podcast episode but can you maybe just for a, um, a minute or two share your experiences at, the, at that college because I think that's of interest to to quite a lot of the people listening to this podcast. Yeah and that's my exposure to that was kind of unusual too at, at one point um, you know that program's been around for probably 50 plus years at this point in Southern California at the Moore Park Community College. I think my first exposure to it there was a television program that they made for a year or two about that program. Uh, it was called More Park 24-7. It just sort of was a reality show um, about the students in that program and kind of what their lives were like going through the co- coursework and you know, working with animals, working with each other, that kind of stuff. I can remember very clearly thinking, I think this was after I had graduated from university and had my four-year degree in psychology and wasn't exactly sure specifically what I was going to do with it yet, um, of watching that show and um, and thinking to myself afterwards, like, I, I will never get to do anything as cool as what those people are doing, which is funny because I, I now am friends with some of the people from those episodes. And I think that was one of the things that, you know, I've always had an interest in animals. I grew up in San Diego, California, so I spent a lot of time at the San Diego Zoo and a lot of time at SeaWorld and the San Diego Wild Animal Park. And every year, you know, my parents enrolled my little brother and I in zoo summer school, so I was spending a significant time there uh, outside of school more than just, you know, visiting on the weekends. And so I feel like that's always been in my DNA a little bit and just got to a point where, you know, I had I was working a full-time job training humans of all things, which was fun and writing technical documentation, which was less fun. But uh, I just started volunteering at the Sacramento Zoo on the weekends just because it was something that you could do and uh, wasn't really career focused at that point. I just wanted to, to be around animals more and being very aware that I was having more fun in my you know eight to 10 hours of volunteering on the weekends than I was at my 40 hours of doing my real job. So got to talking about those you know, with those people at the time at the zoo about kind of what their paths were. And, and it is, like you said, it's so interesting because nobody comes to this from the exact same place. And I kept hearing about this program in California and how difficult it was and how tricky it could be to get in. And I just sort of seized onto the idea. And, and I think it I'll ultimately, once it all shook out, I think I ended up actually being an alternate. I think I only got to go because somebody else sort of dropped out at the last minute. So that worked out pretty well for me. <laughs> so m- much appreciation to whoever it was that wasn't able to to attend the program at that time, uh, back in 2002. But yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a fascinating kind of setup. I, I came to it a, a little bit older than most of the other people because I had already gone to get my four-year degree. And a lot of people were going through that program, you know, as their first sort of post high school education. So some people had had a little bit of college. Some people had already graduated from a university like I had, but getting to get back in the mindset of being a student was something that was interesting after having been out of that for a couple of years and getting into the coursework of, uh, you know, like Debbie said, when you had her on the show, you know, of uh, the anatomy and the physiology and operant conditioning and you know, wildlife education and just sort of immersing yourself in that world. And and the thing for me that I think was the most eye-opening part of that program was just the fact that you learn so much about how diverse this, you know, for lack of a better term, professional animal job community is. I don't know what the best big blanket term for that is, but I think growing up, I kind of had this mind of, you know, there are the people who work at C world and there are vets and that's it (laughs) that's sort of all there is i mean so you see that there are people who you know you see people working at zoos and think that's actually a job that somebody has somebody does that somebody really gets paid to do that so and for me like i said at that time it was the the educational aspect it was the the talking to people working with people um either in classrooms or on stage that i was really kind of interested in i think for me that was the big take home from that was that opportunity to practice being on a stage you know they've got this little theater there at the program we're open to the public on weekends and and uh, you get to do shows for whoever shows up and you do shows with whatever animals they assign to you that day. So having to get really creative about coming up with a theme, coming up with transitions, coming up with behaviors that you can demonstrate for people with animals that you might not necessarily have any experience with yourself, but they happen to be the ones that are in your show at the time, I think was a really good 
place to start uh, learning about the importance of flexibility and uh, ad-libbing and <laughs> knowing what to do when things don't go the way that you expect them to, which can honestly be some of the absolute best interactions with guests is uh, when the animals are not not doing what you think they're going to do. It's a fun opportunity for interpretation. Yeah, well, fantastic. Thanks for that, Chris, and great stories. And, and hopefully you listening can, and can take some inspiration from that, uh, no matter where you are in, in your own odysseys moving forward with, with animal training. Uh, and I think some takeaways from that maybe, uh, and Chris alluded to it, just start volunteering. And, and I think that's what a lot of people do when they start off uh, with their careers and with animal training. Hey, we'll move on to the next question, Chris. Uh, before recording this podcast, you and I discussed some cool projects that you have been involved with in the last wee while. And one that really stuck out, which to a bird nerd like myself just sounds like so much fun is uh, some training you have been doing with a large flock of macaw parrots do you want to maybe tell the audience about your experience with this project and help everyone understand a little bit more about what is involved in doing something like this yeah so the the, the basic elevator pitch for what we're doing with these birds is um, at one of the theme parks in central Florida we do a show where six times a day we fly a flock of about 20 macaws usually 19 to 21 macaws. Uh, they fly from their holding area, from the facility they live in. They fly about a half a mile into the park itself uh, to land on a perch uh, where some of our trainers are there just to do a really uh, short, fun, uh, sort of interactive, interpretive experience. Uh, this is not advertised. For the park's guests, they don't know that it's going to happen. And it's right in the very front of the park. So it, it it's something that you can, if you time it right, you're sort of hitting people right when they arrive with this experience. Um, birds come flying in, uh, hang around, like I said, for about five to 10 minutes, depending on their sort of uh, feelings for the day <laughs> of uh, whether it's really hot or, you know, how they're feeling about the reinforcers that we have available to them. And then when they're done, uh, they fly back home. So uh, we have three flocks of birds. Each of those flocks does that twice a day. So for a total of, of six flights each day. So uh, I, I mentioned to somebody the other day, I said, you know, it's, it's really cool. I've never thought about this. We we produce 122 one mile flights every day. How cool is that? <laughs> it was kind of, a, kind of a fun way to look at it. But, you know, it, it was a huge undertaking. The president of my company, Natural Encounters, is a uh, somebody who will be very familiar to people who understand the operant condition training world, Steve Martin, who's been doing this for over 40 years. And this has been a project that he's wanted to do for about the last uh, 10 to 12 years really seriously wanting to to see if we could make this happen and um i think the project started uh in its earliest phases in october of 2013 and then our first flights for the public were the following june so we've we've been doing this for about two years now and it's it's always changing and it's a uh, it's a dynamic group of birds it's all macaws everything from little small red-fronted macaws all the way up to big hyacinths those largest in the world and we are also fortunate in that we work with a number of blue-throated macaws who are one of the most critically endangered species of macaw in the wild estimates are right now maybe a hundred to 120 left in the wild and we're part of a program that works with the world parrot trust so that um, the offspring from our birds that we have our company were able to get permitted to be released in South America with the end goal being that those birds meet up with the wild birds and all become friends leading to families leading to babies leading to more blue-throated macaws in the future which is super exciting so that's one of the things we always try to highlight with the small time that we have with guests but it's free flight on a level that I've certainly never been a part of. And, you know, talking to Steve and the other trainers, it's definitely one of the most difficult projects we've uh, ever undertaken. And he said that it's it's maybe the most challenging thing he's ever been a part of, which is really humbling considering the amount of experience that he has. So uh, it's a never a dull moment because um, each one of those birds, even though we're, we're just flying them in big groups, they're all individuals. Everybody's behavior has massive implications for the behavior of the other birds in the flock. So I think our our thinking was at this stage in the game, we had a lot of success early on when we started doing the, the program for guests. And I think we felt like two or three months later, this thing would just basically be on autopilot, almost like push a button and they just come out and everything's great. But, you know, they've discovered that flying other places is fun. There are tons of other reinforcers in the environment. And sometimes it's fun to just go sit in a tree for an hour or two and watch the world go by. And, and there's nothing we can do about that. I mean, one of the things that 
that, uh, and I know you appreciate this given what you do, that's really, really fun about working with, with birds in particular is the fact that, you know, when you're working with flighted birds, they really do have the freedom to do whatever they want, including not be with you, leave the area if they wanted to. So it becomes really focusing on building relationships that allow these animals to make choices to want to be with you and to want to be with each other and to be want to be part of the program and sort of always being ready to adjust everything that we do on the fly to help make that happen. So, you know, if you're not focused on really positive, fun relationships with those animals, then you're you're running a huge risk <laughs> of uh, particularly doing something on the level that we're doing it on. So it's, it's kind of crazy. And it's definitely something that I'd love people to get to see, even people who've been doing this stuff for a long time. And, and I, I've been doing it every single day that we've been doing this project. And I, it still sort of takes my breath away every single time I see him fly. It's so much fun. Very cool. And I'd be lying if I was to say I wasn't a tad envious of <laughs> some of the things <laughs> you just talked about. Uh, and I, I think I got goosebumps when, you know, I was listening to you talk about being a visitor to that facility and coming in the entrance and, and being met with that experience, uh, especially when we're talking about influencing those people about the plight of species like the blue-throated macaws in the wild. So absolutely sensational, industry-leading, world-class, and I like I say, I uh, am a tad envious. <laughs> <laughs> we got to get you out here. got to get you out here and hang out with us. Florida is near the top of my bucket list. So yeah, excellent. To make that happen. Hey, what's really interesting about what we've talked about so far in this podcast and other podcasts is something that I really want Animal Training Academy to to help its members understand. And that is the basic principles and science of animal training and behavior apply to all species on planet Earth, in, including you and I. And I thought today, Chris, we could talk a little bit more about this. And, and maybe you could share, because you've got a lot of experience in this, share some of your thoughts on applying positive reinforcement and all these behavior principles to, to us and to interpersonal relationships between people. Yeah, and you know, and it's it's something that I find is is one of my favorite parts of working for the company that I do is that Steve on down, I think we really try to discipline ourselves to take all this stuff that we like to to talk about and we like to apply to our animals and, and really try to, uh, you know, walk that talk with each other as well. You know, if you look at it in its most basic sense, you, you look at the way that behavior works on planet Earth is that, you know, any organism at any given time, anytime it's making a choice is always either going towards something at once or getting a away from something it doesn't want. And that really at its most basic sense is what motivates all behavior. I think disciplining ourselves to think about behavior in a way that is tr always trying to encourage ourselves to create environments and provide consequences that are reinforcing that make animals or I guess organisms may be a better term for what we're talking about now, you know, want to participate, choose to participate, to be a part of a team, to be a part of a conversation, to be a part of a project, because there's something of value to them to think about how motivation works for every individual and to think about, I want to create scenarios where my animals are participating in my programs and in my projects because they want to, because they're looking forward to the consequences. I, I never want to set up a scenario where the animal is participating, you know, for fear of what the retribution will be if they choose not to participate, which unfortunately with a lot of animals, you know, historically, because animal training in one form or another is, you know, thousands of years old, people have successfully motivated animals that way through punishment and negative reinforcement. And it, it keeps happening because it, it works. Um, and because uh, people have success with it. So it becomes reinforcing to the people who do it. You know, thinking about that in terms of the way that, that humans work, you know, I think that so many of us are raised with either a fear of what will happen if we make mistakes, uh, what the consequences will be, what the punishment will be. That's the way that human beings tend to motivate each other quite frequently. So that's sort of the, the broader change that I think we're looking at is not only are we trying to, to open people's minds to, you know, the really impressive things that are possible through positive reinforcement training with animals, just within our own industry, getting people excited about that stuff, but also thinking about how, you know, there's no reason why those same principles should be left at the gate when you go home every day. I mean, it's it's what you should do with all the individuals in your lives, all the organisms in your life. And I guess the, the most basic way that I look at figuring out how to make that work with the humans in my life is um, through communication. We try to talk really consistently about, you know, open, honest, 
two-way communication. I, and I say those words so often that it's just like, you could probably make me a t-shirt that says it. And it, it's, it's those words, you know, I repeat them so much, but when you really stop to think about what those things mean, so open communication. So it's having a relationship with somebody where you really do feel like you could say anything. You don't have to beat around the bush. And it doesn't mean you have to be impolite about things, but that you can really say whatever seems to be necessary, either receiving feedback or giving it, you know, being honest about it. Somebody told me a while ago, probably Steve, you know, even in difficult conversations, if you're coming from a good place and you're coming from a place of support, you really can't go wrong in talking with somebody in discussing maybe difficult subjects. I think the hard part becomes being sometimes in a state of mind when you're communicating with people where if you were really honest with yourself and you had to say, you know, am I really coming at this from a place of support and a place of wanting to make things better? And the answer is sometimes no. It's sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's from a place of anger or frustration or retribution. So you have to take a step back from that and then figure out, okay, how do we actually move past this? And I think that's where the sort of the two-way part of it comes in too. It's that, you know, not only do you have to be open to receiving the feedback that you're getting from your environment and from the other people around you and really take that feedback seriously because that's that's honest communication coming from other people, but also thinking about the way that you're communicating information to other people. And I see that a lot in people who are growing growing their leadership and their management skills is that the the things that they are saying are fantastic. I mean, it, it's good information. It's useful information. It's great feedback that's um, going to maybe help somebody grow or maybe uh, help fix a problem. But, you know, I think what we say is such a little part of what a conversation actually includes and the way you say it, your body language, your tone of voice, you know, what your facial expressions are, whether you're making eye contact or not. So many of those things come into play too. And I think that I tend to think about those things from a performance standpoint because I'm somebody who spends a lot of their time on stage professionally. So you, you think about all those things, but you can apply all those same things to just having a, a one one-on-one -on -one conversation with with a friend or with a family member or with a coworker. In a way, it can be tricky because you're you're sort of having to do a lot of analysis of your own behavior in real time, but I think the it's like anything, practice makes perfect, right? You become better at being a communicator the more you force yourself to practice good communication, being a good listener uh, and being a good speaker. So, uh, and you know, that I'm fortunate in that I get to work with a lot of people who are, are very good at those things. And I try to go out of my way when I see people doing that to reinforce that behavior and let them know how much I appreciate that. So it, it's, it's sometimes, uh, I think that people think that it, I don't know that you guys have ever touched on this in the show and maybe you have, but there's this aspect of, of positive reinforcement training that, you know, I've, I've ever, I've heard people say, well, it's, it's manipulative, you know, especially when it's applied to humans, you know, you're, why are you treating somebody like an animal? Why are you trying to simplify things too? But I, I think it's, you know, we take that step back and say, this is not about manipulation. This is about understanding that everything in the world is a basis of, is based on, you know, it's influenced by its environment and it's influenced by its consequences. And we didn't decide that. That's nothing we can do about that. That's just the way life works. So let's leverage that information and let's make things we like easier for people to do. Let's make things that we like rewarding for animals and people to do. And once you kind of put that filter on things, we kind of joke sometimes with this sort of stuff, this positive reinforcement stuff, it's it's a light that once you see it, you can't unsee it. So once we open that door, you know, it, it can become uh, tricky to, to want to think about things in any other way. I think just be, from a reinforcement standpoint, because you see the successes in it. And I know I've heard Dr. Katz say that on your show before, you know, there's there's not negative fallout from positive training. There's a lot of bad fallout from aversive training, but it, it's hard to see the downside of using this as kind of a one of your filters for your worldview. Yeah, for sure. And I can attest to the culture at Natural Encounters after spending a bit of time with, with your company a couple of years ago in an internship that I did in the States. And, and I have had opportunity in my life to be a part of many organizations. And I definitely felt like you guys were walking the walk there and it was a pleasure to to be in that environment so it sounds like what you're doing is working and, it, and it's great oh, thank you very much yeah it's fun and you know it's and, and even just in the time that i've been with the company it's it's been great to see sort of the evolution of you know the way that we think about things and i think that's one of the other things that's exciting about having a, um, I guess, basing what we do professionally with our animals on sort of the science of how behavior works and behavior change. That science 
is something that is continually evolving and it's something that's improving and it's self-correcting. So just to say, you know, I am a positive reinforcement trainer doesn't mean that you're going to do everything exactly the same way for the rest of your life. Those things are changing. You know, we, we go through these periods of growth of analyzing what we do and saying, is this the best way to do things? It, are there people who are doing things at a higher level? And if so, let's, let's figure out how we can apply that. Let's figure out how we can emulate that. And I think that's one of the things that's really exciting about being a part of the community that we are is that there are a lot of people who are really, really open to wanting to collect all this great experience that everybody has and use it to build a community, you know, because we, we all, you know, have to make a living doing this. And so you can look at what we do as, as a product, you know, to be packaged and sold. And and we do that to a certain extent in the fact that our consultants who help other people, but forming those relationships pays dividends so hugely. I think I told you before the podcast, like my kind of joking take on it is that, you know, despite what you might find going to a professional conference, I'm still convinced that there's only like a hundred people in the whole world who do what we do, because it seems like, you know, if you hear about the work that somebody's doing or facilities doing, if you don't know that person, you probably know somebody who knows that person. And it's very easy to get in touch with each other now. I mean, we're having a conversation from two different sides of planet Earth right now in real time. That's pretty incredible. So we're at a amazing nexus right now where we have so much ability to share information to sort of help open each other's eyes to the, the great possibilities that are that are here for for animals, but also for ourselves too. It's it's pretty remarkable. Yeah, I completely agree. And and everything you've said uh, is so inspiring, Chris. Uh, and I think we walk in the same path. And hopefully, AnimalTrainingAcademy.com can can be a facilitator of, of linking people together. And these podcasts are, are one way of doing that. And it is very cool to be sat here in New Zealand talking to you in Orlando, Florida. I get really <laughs> excited by that. Hey, hey, Chris, for this next question, um, thanks for all that information. I was I was hoping now though that we could explore some other experiences that you've found memorable throughout your career you've had such an amazing experience base can you maybe share uh, two or three stories that really stick out in your mind and some significant lessons that you've learned along the way you know it's a good question and there have been a lot of different things but I think a lot of the things that stick out in my mind are reminders for me that every animal we work with is an individual so you know even if we decide you know I'm going to base my training decisions on positive reinforcement and applied behavior analysis and things like that. It's just to remember that if you've got five animals of the same species that you want to train the same behavior, you may have to go about it five completely different ways because they are all individuals. So I think about a training workshop that I was a part of uh, several years back. We were working with a Harris hawk whose name was Mason, I believe. The student I was working with was interested in, you know, trying to, she had never really worked with hawks before and was trying to think of different things we might be able to do in this four or five day training workshop we had. But try as we might, you know, coming up with different ideas, trying different things out. This this bird was really not interested in much anything we had to offer him. Different food items, you know, different objects we think thought he might want to interact with and just really wasn't interested. But in speaking with the staff who normally work with that bird, because, you know, we went back into sort of the information gathering phase. Okay, who is this guy? What, what is he like? What is he not like? What what can you guys tell me? And, you know, this, the staff telling me, well, you know, it seemed like he's been rather broody lately. Like it seems like he's interested in in breeding season. So that's kind of what he's mostly thinking about. And we said, okay, well, (laughs) how could we leverage that in a way that might make sense? And what we ended up doing was coming up with a, a behavior where the bird would, be able to step up onto sort of a slightly angled platform that had a wire mesh bottom so that we could get a good look at the bottom of his feet. So we could think about things like nail trims or just good uh, skin condition, making sure that the foot pads were healthy. And since this bird didn't really want to have anything to do with us uh, relating to food, the student I was working with said, well, what if we tried giving him nesting material? I said, oh, okay, that could be interesting. And, and one of the things we have a lot of in the trees <laughs> around where we do our training is uh, Spanish moss, the sort of parasitic stuff that hangs around on oak trees mainly. We sort of just gathered up a bunch of that stuff from around the property, made a little pile for ourselves, and at first kind of used it as a lure, did a little bit of baiting to see if the bird was interested in it and see if he would move to acquire it. And and he absolutely would. He would walk towards where it was, grab the stuff in his beak, kind of shake it around a little bit, put it down next to him, and then look back at us and go, okay, what next? So using that as a a reinforcer for the behavior of, of being able to point to a platform, have the bird jump there, hold that behavior for some amount of duration. And then um, his reward uh, being that we just give him some moss that came from a tree that he would sort of hang around with and then toss to the side and be perfectly happy.
happy to, to continue to hang out with us. That was that was something I would not have thought worked. <laughs> but at that time, in that environment with that bird was successful. So that was that was interesting because raptors, I think, are are birds that it can be very easy to sort of see as their behavior is very directed towards food acquisition. You know, some people have birds of prey that they say like to play and interact with things and some many just want to sort of sit and watch the world go by if they're not hunting. So to have one that was that was keen on actually behaving for a consequence that was not food, I thought was very cool. Yeah, and that's a great story, Chris. And it does beautifully illustrate that point that each animal is an individual. Uh, and I think I met Mason <laughs> in 2012. Yeah. I think he was at Dallas. Hey, thank you for sharing that. Uh, and every, every, everyone out there listening as well, that's such an important lesson. Um, so I think we can all learn from from that great story chris we are sadly heading towards the end of this podcast episode now one last question though before we conclude and this question has to do with chris's vision for the future you you get to travel a lot for your role and consequently develop a great overview of animal training and behavior management over numerous organizations and even countries can you tell everyone listening you know what what's your vision what would you like to see occur what would you like to see happen in the next five to ten years with animal training uh, and the use of positive reinforcement and, and a science that you talked about before? Well, I, I think it's a great question and I think it's a great thing for people to be thinking about who are in this industry right now. You know, I feel like over the last probably 10 to 20 years, there's really been a dissemination of this this information about how training can assist people in their everyday lives, how it, it's not just another task that you have to fit into your admittedly busy day, but that it pays dividends not only for, you know, the tasks that you need to get done and things like husbandry, but it also builds really, really strong relationships with animals and can be extremely rewarding for the people doing the training. So I see people everywhere, you know, doing everything they can to carve out just the small amount of time that it might take to be able to, to interact with operant programs with their animals, I, I think is absolutely fantastic. I think the next phase for this is taking a lot of this great work that we're doing with our animals, sometimes in things like shows, but often just off off stage, as they say, you know, behind the scenes, taking as much of that stuff as we can and bringing that out for guests to be able to see, I think is the next phase of where I'd like to see things go with animals. And there are a lot of places that are doing it. I mean, a lot of zoos do things like public feedings or keeper talks, and that's great. But I think the, the next level for that is things that allow people to see animals uh, performing species appropriate behaviors on cue in their exhibits. So that when they come to a zoo, it's not that they just, uh, maybe the panther's out today, maybe he's just sitting up on the tree like normal, but animals are actually active, moving around, searching their environments for things to do, and just taking all those things that we would always have sort of done in the back, which I think is you know, traditionally what we thought was the things that well, I mean, people don't want to see us hosing. People don't want to see us, you know, bringing in the buckets of food and stuff like that. I think that's the stuff that people really do want to see. And I think it's the stuff that people do need to see. So I can remember the first time I saw the the new elephant setup that they have at the San Diego Zoo, where they've basically taken the working wall where they do a lot of the bathing routines and a lot of the foot care and built that so that it's an area where the public can come and watch. That just blew my mind. I thought that was the coolest thing because I think right now, with the explosion of social media and information sharing, you know, there are a lot of people who are, are learning more about what we do in the zoological community. And there's a lot of good information out there, but there's a lot of bad information out there too, or a lot of dishonest information. So I think there are people who aren't just necessarily sure that they even like what it is we do, but I think it's because they don't have enough of an understanding of what it actually is. So I think, you know, the future is in more interactive programming. It's going even beyond just what we think of as traditional shows in doing things like what we do with the free flight macaws in the park in what I see places like Cheyenne Mountain Zoo doing building experiences where they give their animals the ability to leave their exhibits to just build a bridge or build a rope or something they can climb out and you get to see the porcupine you know leave his enclosure and go walk around the zoo and to see that they have the option to be out or not and that they choose to come back, I think is one of the most powerful ways that we can show the people who don't get to do what we do professionally, that we are able to create these profound relationships with these animals that are things that not only they can take into their relationships with the animals in their lives, but hopefully uh, into their relationships with, the, with, with each other. So that's our sort of not so secret end game is taking all this cool animal stuff and using it to help, uh, you know, improve improve the lives of humans too. But um, that's the future for me. It's, it's looking at increased interactivity and just taking everything 
that would generally be sort of behind that curtain. And I've always liked to give people a peek behind the curtain, but I think I just want to get rid of the curtain now. Just completely make as much of what we do as transparent as possible so people can see all the cool stuff that we get to do with these animals. And, and I think that that extra level of understanding is just another thing that helps to connect people with animals and connect people with nature and hopefully lead towards positive change and conservation action, things like that. Hey, so cool. And, and let's hope these things happen. And as quite often happens when I'm recording these podcasts, I'm just sitting here in my chair. I don't even know I'm doing it, but I'm just sitting here nodding. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hey, Chris, that was so much fun. And, and a massive thank you for, for coming on the show today. I really appreciate you taking oh, the time to schedule. So. Absolutely. Very, very happy to be a part of it. You guys are doing great work and I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled, thrilled and honored to, to get to be a part of one of the episodes. Fantastic. And for everyone out there in, in podcast land, this is, this is actually episode number 13 from the Animal Training Tidbits podcast series. And as of this morning, I, I just had a quick look before we did this podcast. We started in January. I think we've had just under 3,200 downloads on the website uh, and it's not even including iTunes. So so if you have been listening to and, and downloading the other episodes, a massive thank you for your guys' support. It is ridiculously appreciated from right down here in New Zealand uh, to the world. Thank you so much. And if you haven't listened to any of the other podcasts, then you can download them all for free from animaltrainingacademy.com or alternatively check them out on iTunes as well. Also, when you're on the website, now, there is a ton of free resources on there for you to benefit from, including the 15 lesson free online course uh, packed with video content, written content, audio content, quizzes, and more. So check that out. I've, I've called it my labor of love to you guys. And the benefits of engaging with Animal Training Academy don't stop there. Oh, no, no. Make sure you, you hit the webinar button in the main menu on animaltrainingacademy.com and make it along to one of my live lessons as well. These are completely free and you can have an opportunity to learn more about animal training and behavior management, interact with me one-on-one -on -one and ask all your pressing questions. They're so much fun. I think we did one uh, last week where one individual was at her third straight webinar in a row. So I've had nothing but rave reviews. Uh, if you haven't already made, made it to one, make sure you register for the next webinar. The next ones are on the 28th and 29th of August. August, so get involved and I can't wait to see you there as always I absolutely love hearing from you guys so please leave a message on the podcast right up let us know if you enjoyed this episode or if you didn't enjoy this episode ask any questions you have tell me what you want to learn about what you want to see on the show tell me some lessons that you've learned from your animal training experience whatever I just love hearing from you guys but for now that's about it uh, good luck with all your training endeavors and you will be hearing from me again soon thanks Chris and ciao everyone <laughs>